The On The Mark podcast is brought to you in part by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. Here should be the most important place to your bank because here is where you are. Synovus, the bank of here. Welcome to On The Mark, a PGA Tour podcast. Here's your host, someone who walks inside the ropes but thinks outside the box, Mark Immelman. How's it? Tiger Woods is on the verge of earning number 82. He's 82nd victory on the PGA Tour. And in so doing, he will tie the great Sam Snead. I am Mark Immelman. Welcome to this podcast. It is Sunday afternoon. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee with my college golf team, the Columbus State University Cougars. We've got our final event of the fall, but it is the Zozo Championship over in Japan and the fourth round was suspended due to darkness, and Tiger Woods is just a few holes away from getting his 82nd PGA Tour victory. Currently has a lead over Hideki Matsuyama, the local favorite, although judging by the pictures, Tiger Woods the local favorite over there too. So just a few holes left for Woods. He does have the victory, and if he indeed he wins, we will have our Tips from the Tour podcast following this one shortly with what you can learn from Tiger Woods as in, and his fantastic player whilst over in Japan in the 2019 Zozo Championship. This one, it's something I've been looking forward to for a long time. And we've had um, Adam Young on this podcast before. He's very insightful, very experienced. And there's a wonderful way of being massively successful with each and every player he teaches, whether they be beginners or golfers at the highest level. And he explains theory well, and he's got a wonderful way of getting the golfer to think less and yet still improve their technique. And I reached out to him, and I was like, Adam, we've got to get you on here again to talk about your uh, impact fundamentals. And he was very, very keen on this. Of course, he calls them his seven golf impact laws. And we'll delve into this conversation in just a bit. But before, of course, we do that, thanks for downloading this one. You can find all of our podcasts at pgatour.com slash podcasts or at pgatour.com slash on the mark or at iTunes or Stitcher or TuneIn or just go and search for us. Go on the web, go download the PGA Tour app. You can get us over there. But go on the web and search for on the Mark podcast, on the Mark Golf podcast, and you will get us. Uh, lots of great stuff. And if you haven't listened to the first Adam Young podcast, it may be worth your while. But this one certainly will kind of just succinctly summarize everything for you. And each impact law has a cool drill that you're going to employ. And you will find that if you do these things, you will quickly understand how to present this golf club to the golf ball and have that happen consistently well so that you can improve your ball striking and then hopefully by extension your scores. If you have done well here lately and uh, there's been a podcast that has helped you, reach out to us, let us know. We are keeping records of which podcasts have had the most um, success with folks. So follow us on Twitter. We are at On The Mark Radio. Tweet us there. Let us know which has helped out and we will keep a record of that so we can bring you more of that sort of stuff. Let's call this the research we're doing here at this On The Mark podcast. Me personally, as my phone just dingles, it's a message from Adam Schreiber, great golf instructor, has worked with many players, including Anthony Kim. Remember him? Well, I'm going to be interviewing Adam later tonight, and we will have that podcast for you here down the track. So some good stuff in store also. Watch wherever you get your podcasts for that. Um, but again... Back to the Twitter thing. The handle here is at on the Mark Radio. Me personally, give me a follow. I'm at Mark underscore Immelman. Same handle at Instagram. I'm trying to uh, do a better job there of putting up more content for my job as a golf coach and a golf instructor so you can see some drills and some swings and that sort of stuff that I do because I'm sure all you, the most important, most informed golf audience around the world, like to see that sort of stuff. Well, with that, let's get you understanding impact with Adam Young just a little bit more and certainly a whole lot better. This segment of the On The Mark podcast, it's brought to you by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here.
He's been on our show before and he's with us once again, and I am very thankful. Adam Young, welcome, man. Welcome back. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me back on again. It was fun last time. Well, it's my pleasure. I mean, you just you, you put out so much good stuff and and open disclosure for the folks listening to this. I saw a tweet that you put out and I, I texted you right away and I'm like, Adam, we gotta do this. And then you and me getting together was difficult. Um, but you finally we finally worked it out, and that was the seven impact laws. But before we get there, quickly for the folks who don't know you, uh, share a quick uh, whistle stop through the bio. So I am a PGA professional. I have been coaching. Oh, you know what? I haven't worked this out. I started when I was 20. <laughs> Forever, man. <laughs> I've been coaching for 13, 14 years now. I forget how old I am sometimes. Um, so yeah, most of my life, well, pretty much all of my working life, I've been a full-time coach and I've managed to coach at some amazing facilities like IMG Academies in, in Florida. Uh, I worked for Ledbetter Academies for many years and was director of golf in Spain. Had the opportunity to come out to America, to Santa Barbara, one of the most beautiful places in the yeah. world. So I was very fortunate there and, uh, and did that. And I've actually now moved to Vegas uh, because as beautiful as Santa Barbara was, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's a little bit, or let's just say it's more affordable. No, I, I'll be honest, I couldn't afford it in <laughs> California. But <laughs> so Vegas is close enough to home for the wife, and it's uh, it's a place that we can start a family. So yeah, I'm looking to start an academy out here pretty soon. Awesome. Well, that is great, man. You help people all over the world, and ladies and gents, I can uh, absolutely. Um, I can absolutely agree with Adam. He is busy nonstop. In fact, getting some time to get this guy on the line. We are snatching him off the driving range because there are people waiting. So let's whistle through this. Um, the seven impact laws, and you made a statement that I love. I'm going to say it, and then I want you to embellish. And your statement, Adam, goes, the seven impact laws determine your shot results. If you don't change one or more of these your results are not going to change. <laughs> this is truth, and I want you to talk about that, please. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time kind of restructuring that sentence over and over again until I always want a, a message that really hits home. And yeah, mm -hmm. in, the impact laws are everything. If you want to change that result, there's no way about it. You have to change something at impact. So mm -hmm. there's even more when I when I stress that in my voice, you have to change something at impact if you want to change the result. There's no two ways about it. It's physics. Now, there are many ways of doing that. Obviously, most people go about changing their swing mechanics directly, which is certainly a viable way. Um, but I, I always liken it or use the analogy of a computer game. Okay. So uh, even if you've never played one before, you can kind of get the idea. You've got, you, you could focus on three things. You could look at the screen. So imagine you're playing like a soccer game or an NFL game or something like that. And you could look at the screen and play the game by just by looking at the screen and thinking about passing. But that doesn't really help if you don't know the buttons yeah. or what the buttons do. Mm -hmm. And so impact to me is basically what are the buttons? To what, are, what actually cause, what actually creates the mm -hmm. result. Okay. And so once you've learned the buttons, once you're pretty good with the buttons, then you can go back to focusing more on the game itself. But it's a little bit of a, a mismatch, a little bit of um, a shooting darts blindfolded, I always say. If you, if you don't know what the buttons are, you're just bashing around and hopefully you, you start to do something and you correct. And you become the victim of what I call Advil for the golf swing or for the international folks, uh, your generic yeah. painkiller that is prescribed for any ailment. And those things include, hey, I kept, didn't keep my eye on the ball, I lifted my head oh, or I swung too far, you know, you know, that sort of stuff. That to me is Advil for the swing. And if you don't know what you're what the buttons are to continue your anecdotes, you, you, you're falling for those sorts of things. Well, this is it. I mean, for many years, we didn't know what the buttons were. You, mm -hmm. you go back and read any book and it's all, and, and here's where the analogy stems out a, a little bit even, even further, is that most golfers and even most instructors are actually thinking about the, the thumb angle or the yeah. wrist angle. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, ha they, they're saying how to push the button without ever telling you about what the button does or what 
what, which button to press. So sure. yes, you you could press the right buttons by telling someone right, put your thumb at ninety degrees and move it forward. It's a really complicated way of doing it, which is which kind of turns off a lot of golfers because they're like, wow, this is so complicated. Whereas when you take that away and you get them to focus on the buttons instead, not how to push it. We can figure out how to push the buttons once we know what the buttons are. Yeah, so <laughs> and true. so a, a, a lot of my instruction goes towards unveiling what the buttons are, what they actually do. And so when golfers realize this, they go, wow, I can create the result I want. And it, it's not it's not as difficult as I thought it was. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's basically what the impact laws are. They are the controls for the game. They are what control the outcome. All right, let's uh, let's enlighten folks. I'll skip through them and then we'll delve into them. The seven impact laws from Adam Young: ground contact, face contact, speed, face direction, swing path, angle of attack, dynamic loft. All right, let's begin at the beginning there. Um, first impact law: ground contact. Yeah, that is a huge one. If I if I'm to give an amateur just one thing to focus on, it would be the ground contact. Okay. So yeah, it's it's basically where does that divot start, if anything, with an iron. Now you're not going to contact the ground with a driver. Hopefully, you're not going to do it with a putter. Um, but w- with an iron, you are going to contact the ground to some extent. And it doesn't have to be a huge divot. It could be a, a just a light brushing of the grass. But all those factors go into it, the depth that you're going through the grass, the location where you're, where you're striking the ground. And we know that you can see it on TV when they do these beautiful slow motions now that the ball is struck first with an iron and then the turf is struck after, sometimes up to an inch or so after the golf ball. Mm-hmm. Whereas we know amateurs, they will strike the ground early. They'll strike the ground first. And then they usually say, something like I lifted my head, which is completely yeah, irrelevant. Uh-huh. Um, or they just, they, they then start to believe maybe unconsciously that striking the ground is a bad thing. Cause every time they hit the ground, the ball goes nowhere. Mm-hmm. Cause I know for, even from my own testing, if you strike the ground an inch behind the ball, you, you probably don't notice that much of a, a result change. But if you strike two inches behind the ball, that ball can drop off 30% of distance or more, depending on the ground conditions. Yeah. It's hugely important for distance control. Absolutely. Now, there are various factors that go into where the club strikes the ground or where, uh, I guess, you know, as this pertains to a driver, where the low point of the swing is located. We won't dig mm-hmm. into those. But I want you, Adam, because I know you do this a bunch, um, share a drill with the listeners that they can do to help them to get that club to lower to the right place uh, in the swing arc. Yeah, I mean, this is this is where the average golfer will immediately ask, well, how do I hit the ground in the right place? And we could go into a really in-depth geometry of low podcast. points, arc height. You could talk about weight shift. I mean, yeah, it could be an entire podcast or a series. Um, but one of the drills I found to be really, really effective is getting an old club. So okay. I usually get something out of the second-hand box. Get on a piece of concrete. And I draw a little X on the concrete. Mm-hmm. And I just say, right, can you, make, can you make a swing where you chip the concrete very lightly so it doesn't hurt? So, oh, okay. by, by the way, if anybody's listening to this, don't go out and do this and ruin your, <laughs> ruin your clubs <laughs> or, or hurt yourself. It uh-huh. has to be supervised. But, yeah, immediately people will make a swing, and their first swing might be four inches behind that X. And, we say, and they go, wow, I didn't realize I was hitting that far behind it. And then the next swing will be better without me saying a word. Mm -hmm. And if I came back in five minutes, they'll be hitting that X. Or they will have improved on average by about 50 to 60% or so without me saying a word. So people can, again, people can figure out how to push the button if they're told what the button is. And they're giving reasonable feedback on it. Well, what I like too is you were the guy um, that highlighted to me the term skill acquisition. And, you, you know, I was, you know, always the instructor who was trying to help the individual to better understanding. You know, information is one thing, but understanding how to apply it is another. And, and sometimes mm-hmm. one can get a bit too locked up in technique where, you know, just striking the ball in a certain area of the club face, you know, if you're striking in the heel, go and try and strike it in the toe, the human being, the athlete, will arrange themselves or recruit, you know, different areas of the body or whatever to get 
the uh, the task completed or the skill acquired. And so this to me sounds another one of those where it's like acquire the skill of just clipping the cement in the right place because you will begin to do what resembles a fairly efficient golf swing to pull us off, right? Exactly. I mean, my mind is going all over at different tangents for this. There's another sure podcast series uh-huh. in yep. itself. Um, but yeah, the idea of instead of focusing so much on how to do it, how to strike that X or how to strike the center of the face, you just go out and actually do it, get good feedback and explore a little bit. So like you said, try to hit the toe, try to hit the heel. So say I have someone who cannot hit that spot on the ground. They cannot chip the concrete anywhere near that spot I've placed. I'll ask them, can you hit a foot in front of it? And immediately they will change something. They'll get closer to the answer. And then Mm -hmm. their mind then goes into, oh, so that's what it feels like to strike the ground where that spot is. It feels so different to what I'm doing. And then you can actually play off that feeling. So it's not, we are changing the technique by doing that. Yes. If you looked at someone when I asked them to hit a foot in front, they'll have a different weight shift. They'll have a different release pattern. So technique does change. But it's not the focus. It's not the focus. The focus exactly. is the task itself. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I, I want to stop there because that could go into a whole <laughs> podcast in itself okay. easily. But, yeah, it's just a completely different way of looking at it, looking at improvement. Mm-hmm. And ground contact, obviously, it's for the irons. As the individual addresses this little X in the drill, um, where is that in relation to the stance, Adam? Well, you could do it from a textbook position. So, you know, if you go by the Nicholas philosophy of a couple of inches in front of the, or behind the lead foot, uh-huh. you could go with that. Um, once a player is reasonably good at striking that X, I'll actually add some variability. So I'll say, well, let's put that X back in your stance. Now let's see if oh, you can okay. hit it. Let's put it in front of the stance. So we're actually challenging them even more. I wouldn't do that with a complete beginner. In fact, I would make it a step easier for the complete beginner and say, place it wherever you want <laughs> at this moment okay, in time. Okay, just hit there That's consistently. Not- Exactly. It's not a long-term goal. It's not a long-term goal because there are other factors that we have to balance, but it's certainly just get this task done now. And for a beginner, once they can strike that X and get the ball up in the air, at least they're addicted to the game now. They might not be Mm -hmm. doing it with the air quotes right technique, but they're doing it and they're getting a good result as, as as a result of that. Love it. Okay, I love that. I mean, again, we could stay there forever, but You've got yeah. people waiting. Um, so to that, <laughs> we've we've touched on face contact already, but you've got that as number two. So let's let's dig into face contact, please. Yeah, so face contact is hugely important for distance, distance control, um, even direction for with the, yeah. the bigger headed clubs. Mm-hmm. So if if some of your uh, more educated listeners have, have heard of something called gear effect, you know that is a, a huge thing. You you could make a. a perfect swing where the path is going through, the face is going through square. So a swing that would send the ball down the fairway, and that could actually miss out of bounds left just from striking the toe yeah. or vice versa. So, yeah, striking the toe or the heel can affect direction um, with the bigger-headed clubs, and that's the important part of that sentence there. Mm-hmm. With the irons, it doesn't affect direction as much. What I love what you do too on your Twitter account is, you sometimes pitch um, little challenges there where you show a video and you're like, okay, this was the data. Where did the ball go? And oftentimes mm-hmm. the correct answer, and I've read through all the responses to these, is the individual goes, well, where did it strike on the club face before we make our assessment? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I play tricks on people with certain things <laughs> as well. I've been Just watching to... you. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all to play. Sometimes I'll do it completely legit. Um, like I posted the side by side swing, um, which was one, one of them, the, the eight iron went 160 yards and the next one, it went 60 yards. And I posted those swings side by side and I said, spot the difference. And I actually had people come to me and they, they, they commented saying they are not, they're not different. They're the exact same swings. You're you're pulling a trick on us. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, they're the same swings. And on the other end of the spectrum, I've had it where I ask a player to hit the toe. I ask them to hit the heel. I film those swings and put them side by side. And then I ask the the audience, I say, which one do you think was the heel shot? And the swings look identical. No one can guess it until right at that very last moment of impact. Mm-hmm. 
okay, well, you, you, it's all very cool, and I've watched you do this, and it's great fun. Um, but the lesson for the listener is, hey, where the ball strikes the face is crucial to power and direction. So what's the drill? How, what can someone go and try to make sure they hit the sweet spot a little more regularly? Well, there are lots of drills, but one of my favorite is just a feedback drill. Um, so getting a can of Dr. Scholl's foot spray or oh, Dactaring if you're in the old. UK, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah, you can even use a, a dry erase marker pen and, and put a little dot on the ball, um, on the back of the ball, and then it transfers to the face when you hit the ball. So that's a, a little bit more elaborate way, but it does give more precise data. And from that alone, I've had so many players who come to me who say, well, who are claiming I'm not hitting it well, something's wrong with my swing. We do that drill, we have a look at the club face, and we see that they're striking out of the toe or the heel. And again, that's just showing them the button without me telling them how to do it. Yeah. Many people, not all, but many people can actually just recalibrate that strike just from seeing where it was. They were awesome. unaware of it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that's great stuff. Right, we're through two. There are five left. Uh, number three on your list is speed. Please go there. Yeah, so speed is pretty much the biggest limiter to our maximum distance. Um, if you swing 100 mile an hour, you are not going to carry the ball 300 yards. It's as simple as that, unless it's downhill, downwind. Okay. Uh, in, under normal conditions, you need a certain amount of club head speed. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 the, biggest, it's the biggest cause okay. of distance. Well, 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 let, well, let's go there a little bit because I find, and I'm sure this is um, emblematic of most folks listening to this, that their, their feeling or their idea of speed is off base because they're feeling more speed in the body than what is translated and transmitted to the golf club head. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, there can be there can be so many ways of improving speed. And like you said, the, the pros look so easy as they do it because they're doing the speed in the right area. So one of my favorite drills for speed is just to get an alignment stick out and ask people to make as loud a swish as they can down by the ball or even slightly after it. Okay. Um, and people will instantly unlock some, some movement. They'll create a little bit more fluidity, more relaxation to create that speed, as opposed to, like you alluded to, most golfers, they kind of feel it more in their body because yeah. they might confuse strength with speed. And it's not, I mean, speed can be just a relaxed fling through the ball as opposed to this kind of trying to muscle it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just that, that's where kind of concepts and little simple drills can unlock the right technique. Again, if I just ask someone to swish that stick as loud as they can, their technique changes and lots of internal mechanics change that we couldn't see on a, ca on a camera, but that's so in the right way. Yeah, and listen, uh, one of my mentors, I was fortunate to know him, the great John Jacobs. He always made the statement to me, he's like, why are you trying to delay the hit? Why don't you just make sure the hit's at the right place? Uh, and yeah. I'm sure if someone listening to this swings that stick and they hear the swish, they won't be trying to lag or hold on to that golf club. They are basically unloading and transmitting, and it might even feel like, you know, wrist arms, whatever it might be, moving a little earlier than what they're used to doing. Exactly. I mean, we see that now even delving into the 3D biomechanics and looking at wrist angles and things like that. We can see that the pros aren't holding on to these angles. They're not trying to completely stop the wrists from moving. They're, they're actually doing it really, really rapidly just at the right point, exactly. like you said. And if you pause a, an image at impact, and yeah, you might get the illusion that, um, someone's holding on to certain angles, but no, they've just, they've just released it at a different time and they're releasing it hard. You know what? That's a very astute observation there, folks. Still images do not tell the entire story. Okay, that's speed, easy to do. Go and get out there and swish something around make sure you hear the noise at the right time. Um, face direction, uh, to me, this is a big one. I'm a Jacob's disciple. You know, he's got his, his four factors. Uh, talk about face direction, please. Yeah, it's a huge one for it, it deals with the direction of the shot and all else being equal, a face that is more left, the result will be more left and vice versa. So many people obsess over swing paths, but 
Oh, uh, and it's, it's, it's a valuable thing, yeah. certainly, but even if your path is five degrees left or five degrees right, you can still hit an online shot. It would just mm -hmm. be shaped onto yeah, the target. Exactly. So someone with a five degree left path uh, might shape the ball left or right onto the target or fade. But they, regardless of what your path is, whether it's out to in or into out, a good club face angle, a functional club face angle, will produce a functional result. Mm -hmm. True. Now, we've had people on the podcast that would let folks know or, or, or speak to the fact that it's easier to get a swing path more consistent than face presentation. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's a big assumption. Um, I want your take on what individuals can go and do in terms of at least getting an idea as to where the toe-heel relationship is uh, throughout the swing. What's a neat drill? Um, a good one. I do this with complete beginners is just to experiment a little. So I will ask complete beginners, can you present the face to the right at impact? And then I get them to hit 10 shots and inevitably they can. And then I say, well, can you do the opposite? Can you get the club face to be left at impact? And inevitably they can. Now can you slot it between? So that's kind of mm. level one. Okay. You know, hitting shots right, hitting shots left, hitting shots straight, which kind of goes against the the um, the idea of perfect practice, which again yeah. is another podcast in itself. Um, but yeah, once once players can do that, we layer on a little bit more difficulty. So I might say, well, can you do five different shot types? So an extreme right, a small right an extreme oh, left, like a small left, mm -hmm. then a center. In fact, I have ways of um, of kind of quantifying all of this, even without the use of a track man, so players can monitor how good they are at this skill. And, uh, yeah, if, I, if I'm on a track man, for example, I might get someone to, I'll say to them, can you present the club face between three and five degrees to the right? Now can you do it to the left? And we mm -hmm. close those boundaries in depending on their existing skill level. And by doing that, by exploring these different boundaries, just like exploring face strike, players are much more able then to recalibrate a good shot. But when I go back to saying, right, can you get that face zero? Players are much more able to do it once they've explored a little bit yeah. Yeah, either, either side of that. And just to take this a bit farther, and I guess this is probably for the more advanced golfer now, you know, the golfer who wants to make sure the face never gets left of zero. So they in a window that's, you know, anywhere from zero to two degrees right or left, or whatever the case might be. Is that as simple as getting there on a launch monitor or out there hitting shots that make sure the thing never goes to the right or never goes to the left? Uh, what are your what's your take? Oh, I don't know. There's, there's, uh, it's difficult to eliminate one side yeah. of the golf course. You 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 can get close to it. I mean, the, the stats are kind of. I've seen I've seen arguments both sides of this. Um, and I know John Sinclair, uh, he's, he's another great mm -hmm. professional. He says that, yeah, he can he can never miss left pretty much. And I'm pretty simple, uh, or pretty similar rather, in that I, I never really miss to the right. Um, my ball always curves to the left some, some amount. So maybe 1% of my shots miss to the right. So it okay. can be done. Right. And, yeah, I think it's just uh, um, there, there are lots of factors that will go into that. But you can play certain games on the range where you give yourself a target and play where you get a point if you're in that target, but you lose three points if you miss left of that target. Oh, I like it. And what happens then as a result of playing that game, people are less likely to miss to the left. They figure out instinctively how to get that ball on the target and, and lower their left miss oh, or right miss if you flip that game over. Very cool. All right, uh, close, you know, uh, to me, the face is king and the swing path is queen. Uh, let's talk about mm -hmm. uh, the swing path some, please. Yeah, so the swing path has a lesser influence on, on direction because uh, it doesn't influence launch direction as much. Uh, but the swing path is still important. As I said, you can have an offline swing path and still play great golf. Uh, we don't want to see it too offline. If you're if you're swinging 10 degrees left or right, it's pretty difficult to play elite level golf with mm -hmm. that. Although there are some guys out there like Bubba who might go into those ranges. Um, but yeah, in general, the the ball will curve the opposite direction to your swing path, all else being equal. So the more you swing to the left, the more that ball will curve to the right, and vice versa. 
Yeah. But obviously the face has a lot to do to the thing because, I mean, I could swing left and have the face pointing to the left of where the path is going and the ball's going to start left and go farther left. Yeah, well, that's all else. All else being yes, equal, the ball will curve more to the to the right or less to the left, depending on what the face is doing. Yeah, so it's it's basically when you're looking at overall direction, you are combining the impact factors of yeah. path and face, and then strike if if you have a bigger heavy club in your hand. Of course. Uh, now path. You know, a lot of folks think about you know pitch of swing when they think to path. They think of swing plane really where. You know, you could have something steepish looking on the way down, yet still hit from the inside. Um, so I just want you quickly to share a drill with folks that they can do just to iron out or at least get a sense for uh, the angle that the club's approaching the golf ball from, please. Yeah, that my go-to uh, go-to drill for this, I, I can change people's paths instantly. Right. And I have a golf ball with a nail through it. Mm-hmm. And I just place that golf ball on the ground and I can angle it to the right and say, can you hammer that? And instantly their swing path goes more to the right. Very simple. Can you hammer it left? And so I can get players to change really extreme if they want this, this swing path. And as a result, their swing mechanics change as well. Their entire sequence, their playing, um, they keep something similar, uh, but they they are able to via this nail on the on the ground analogy they're able to manipulate and change their swing path to what they want and that's how i do it in my own in my own swing i'm not thinking too much about anything complicated i'm just like let's get this club moving more left or right through impact hey you know what able to do it i love that i love the simplicity of it and i tell you what I love it too because so many golfers, when they get over the golf ball, they're standing to the side of the thing for starters, obviously, and then the target's somewhere in the distance. And, you know, the idea of where I exist in space is kind of lost because they're like, dang, there's a ball to it and I've got to get it there. And all of a sudden, they just lose themselves. And that's a beautiful visual for someone who's wanting to shape their swing in one or other direction. Yeah, definitely. You can put alignment sticks on the ground as well, either side of the ball, to help with that perception, for, for sure. But I just I like the drill. Well, I, I like the nail drill. I like it. To be honest with you, as, as I've listened to you, I like the T also because, you know, then it can start to have a golfer focus not just on the path, but I'm assuming, and I'm looking for your take, that if there's a nail through the back of the golf ball, the individual will begin to organize themselves to get the sweet spot of the club, kind of looking over that nail too, right? Definitely, yeah. I mean, you can move that nail either side of the ball. This is another extension to that nail drill. So if I place that nail a little closer to the person's feet um, and ask them to hit that, they would strike more towards the toe and vice versa if I do it the other side. So you can actually, if if I have a player who has a swing path error and a face strike error, I can just use that nail drill and give them one simple focus that fixes both. Tremendous. All right. I can imagine lots of the folks listening to this are going to go and hammer a nail through a golf ball and go, and, can't hit it. And just, it's just, this is just an isometric drill, no striking, right? <laughs> just, <laughs> just a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So don't hit the nail in the golf ball, folks. We don't want to, uh, you to hurt yourselves. All right. Two more. Yeah. Um, angle of attack. This is a big one. Folks looking at social media will hear this stuff a bunch especially when it, as it pertains to the driver. Um, but talk about social, uh, talk about the angle of attack, please. Yeah, angle of attack is quite a popular topic these days because of the, the driver. Uh, as you said, in order to maximize distance with the driver, um, hitting on the upswing is, is what we need to do for, for the vast majority of players. In, in fact, even at the highest speeds, the top long drive champions they all hit up on it an incredible amount sometimes like 10 11 degrees or so which is and we have to bear in mind this is only for maximizing distance yeah. mm-hmm. this is not necessarily for performing your best with a driver there are plenty of players who are great drivers who hit down on it hey let's so, not let's not open that brandle chambly splat a splat yeah. again remember that thing <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, hitting up for me, it worked. It, it took me from a player who could only carry the ball 220 to now I can carry the ball 275 with very low club head speed. I was never a high speed player. Um, so for me, it was huge in, in, into increasing distance. And I think for a lot of amateurs, it can really help them because we see now that the stats all show that the more yardage you get, the 
the uh, the lower your scores can be, obviously within reason, you don't want to be hitting balls out of bounds left and right or everywhere. But but yeah, if if you have a more upward angle of attack, you have more potential for distance. Okay, how did we get this achieved? Uh, let's first uh, do a drill to make the angle of attack a touch steeper or on the way down, or and then another one to catch her more on the way up. Well, if you want to make it steeper, uh, I usually go back to that concrete drill again, and I would say, okay. can you hit that spot? And then I would ask them to, to dig a little deeper into the concrete or make a louder chip. All so right. the louder the chip, usually, uh, from what I've seen on Trackman when doing it, it correlates to a steeper angle attack. Yes. And if I ask someone to strike that chip with a very, uh, a very light uh, touch of the concrete, then it tends to shallow the angle attack as well. Really, we're looking at where is the low point Yes. relative to the ball mm -hmm. to change uh, to change angle attack so with a driver the opposite is true you want you want the low point to be more behind the golf ball to, to get an upward angle attack tremendous. and go on. no i was gonna say i was about to say tremendous uh, and, and and let you go on uh, please please continue oh. Yeah, I was going to say, you can go through mechanical ways. You could look at setup. Get This is why we say with the driver, place the ball a little more forward in the stance, maybe tilt the spine slightly away from the target, keep your head more behind the ball, all of these things. Um, a, a simple concept that I would use with people, and I do it with myself, is just to place the logo on the back of the ball, slightly on the underside, and I say, keep your eyes on that through, throughout uh, the swing. Hey, you know what, that so reminds staying me... staying more behind it. That reminds me of a Gary Playerism um, from way back in the day. He said to me, out of fairway bunkers, you know, you want to catch the golf ball first, obviously, not the sand first, especially there. And he said on the yeah. fairway bunker shot, he would train his vision on a dimple right in the front side of the golf ball, and that will right. lend itself to striking ball first. And... Your take is just on the opposite, opposite side of the hole and uh, ball and underneath, and so you'd remain more back and create more an ascending path through contact. Exactly, yeah. And and using the nail analogy as well, um, you could just place that ball with the nail through it on the tee and angle that nail slightly towards the sky and say, how would you hammer that? And instantly <laughs> I see players set up differently in order to achieve that. Wow, interesting. So I'm guessing then for your final uh, observation or uh, final uh, impact law dynamic loft you could use the nail and point that downward to i'm assuming right you can yeah if i give a hundred golfers a downward angled nail they would tend to produce um, a lower dynamic loft i don't usually do that for certain reasons i don't like golfers to try to hit down too much yeah, they, they can point. kind of just get a little bit thumpy so if i want a more downward angle attack i kind of play around with where a player strikes the ground or the depth of divot um which uh, i shouldn't even have said that is going to kick off <laughs> <laughs> argument on twitter but um yeah it's uh, i understand that depth of divot does not always equate to angle yes. attack but in terms of practical on the lesson um, coaching, it, it can. You can play around with different concepts with that. Well, so. well, well, to that for the folks that have just heard dynamic loft and they're like, what on earth is dynamic loft? Uh, please uh, enlighten them. Yeah, dynamic loft is the loft of your club at impact. Which so, might not be know, the loft that it says on the bottom of your driver, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. Down to a lot of different reasons, whether the face is open or closed at impact or how much forward shaft lean you have at impact. You're going to change that loft of the club. A, a 60 or a 60 degree wedge is not going to be 60 degrees at impact, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, you can play around with it. And you can play around with the speed drill as well, where you release that that stick. If you go back to the alignment stick drill of making a swoosh. And if I feel that swoosh a little bit later, then I produce a lower shot. And yes. if I feel that swoosh a little earlier, I produce a higher shot because mm -hmm. effectively it changes not only where the speed is, but how much, uh, how much loft you're applying at impact. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about dynamic loft because obviously it's got a, a huge effect on the distance of the golf ball. But not a lot of folks, club golfers perhaps, really have the ability to really download the face of that golf club and they'd be, they wouldn't be very well served trying to create more dynamic loft. Or am I crazy? 
this no this is perfect i mean i've made this argument for for years and i actually got shot down in a in a golf wrx article uh-huh. for it everybody thought i was crazy and the the reason why i i was i started coaching and i was coaching some beginners and maybe beginner ladies and juniors with lower speed and yes all of them early released and they hit these nice shots up in the air i would stick them on on camera side by side with Tiger Woods and, and see, well, Tiger has so much more lag, so much more shaft leaner impact. And I was actually a very good coach at being able to make players do the positions that I wanted them to. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, <laughs> when I got Mrs. Havercamp to look like Tiger Woods, the ball didn't go more than knee height. Yes. And so I quickly learned that, oh, maybe there's a speed and shaftling relationship here. And, and maybe mm-hmm. the pros create so much shaftling because they create so much speed and exactly. they have to. And maybe Mrs. Haberkamp would be better served with more of a, a neutral leaning shaft impact. Uh, I never like to see it leaning backwards, but certainly I like to see a more neutral position with lower speed players. Well, I'm so glad that this came up because, you know, anyone can be their own worst enemy um, on internet where you find something about that where if you don't have enough speed and you're catching on the way down with some shaft lean, the ball will never get in the air. And Jack Nicholas was quoted as saying, in how many years of playing golf, he finally realized that the air provided less resistance than the ground to the golf ball. So, <laughs> so it would go further yeah. if it was in the air. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, a lot of equipment things go into this. But like I said, the, the, the biggest thing is Speed. If you have a lot of speed, then you can create forward shaft lean. In fact, you need more forward shaft lean with a lot of speed to create optimal distances. Mm-hmm. Because if, if a tall player looked like Miss, Mrs. Have a camp at impact, they'd just hit the ball. It'd be a moon ball. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of this reverse correlation. You know, I used to think that lots of lag and lots of shaft lean created speed. And it's actually the reverse. It's lots of speed mm-hmm. creates the necessity for lots of shaft lean, which creates the necessity for lots of lag. So yeah. it's, uh, again, that's a huge topic, correlation, causation, one that I've written to a post on. But, yeah, it's the, the take-home for, for that for the average golfer is don't always look to uh, the model swings on tour because they might not be the ideal model for you. Yeah. You know what? I do a podcast called Tips from the Tour, and I've – Never, ever dealt with shaft lean uh, and dynamic loft. Yes, it's it's a thing, but it's really a thing at the highest level. And, and if folks want to practice it, I would typically just take them green side and have them just learn to, you know, maneuver the trajectory of a wedge. Some do you do? Uh, do you have anything else that someone could try? Perfect. That, that's exactly what I do. I might play around with low point position. I might play around with where they produce the speed. But typically, I like what you just said. I like short swings, trying to hit different trajectories with short swings and then adding speed to that. Yeah. Uh, one of the great lessons I've ever heard, one of the great ball strikers I've ever met as a young person, all their coach had them do was hit balls off tight lies. Okay, mm-hmm. and then they had to launch the ball underneath what was like an old um, bench that was just a little bit higher than normal. So if a tight lie mm-hmm. trying to get the ball underneath that bench, especially around the greens, well, that parlayed itself throughout the iron game. And that this individual hits the center of the club face and flights it as good as anybody in the game. Oh, definitely. I mean, that's where the idea of uh, what you've described there is a constraint, what we call it in motor learning theory. So you you create a constraint, which is a, maybe a tree, like Harvey Panic used to say, hit balls under the tree, or mm-hmm. you just said hit balls under the bench. And from that, the right technique arises without a player having to think about it. Seve was a great example of this, right? Oh, he, yes. he learned to strike the ball on a beach. He used to skip school, mm-hmm. go down to the beach and hit balls. The sand is probably the greatest constraint to improve ground contact because you absolutely have to strike ball, then sand in order to do that, which is probably why Seve was such a good iron player. Hey, Vijay Singh still to this day, you'll see him when I go to, I don't go to many Champions Tour events, but at Augusta National every year, he'll ease over to one of the fairway bunkers there in the practice, short game practice uh, area and hit some long irons out there. And man, that guy can still hit the middle of the club face as, as regularly as the sun rises. Definitely, yeah. 
yeah, I love I love the Sandro. It was one of my in my last place in La Manga Club in Spain, and we had a a, a fairway bunker that I could actually um, hit into the range from. It's very rare oh. to have that, mm-hmm. and so it was amazing just to take beginners in there, draw a line in the sand, and get them to strike that line, and then place a ball in the way, and instantly their striking has improved. Beautiful seven impact laws. I couldn't advocate this anymore, folks. So go and check out what Adam Young is doing, but at least check out these things and try the drills. Adam, thanks for your time, man. Um, where can people find your stuff? www.adamyounggolf.com. I have everything there, lots of free book blogs, free e-books, free videos, and then I've got premium content on there too. And social media, please. Uh, Twitter, that is at Adam Young Golf. And then Instagram, I don't use Instagram as much, but Adam Young dot golf on Instagram. Awesome. Uh, I've kept too much of your time, but I'm sure the folks around the globe appreciate it. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate everything that you do. That was really fun. Thank you for having me on again. This segment of the On The Mark podcast was brought to you by Synovus. Synovus, the bank of here. Well, really not too much more that I can add to that. Just so in-depth, so easy to apply, easy to understand, which for me was the big deal. And really good stuff there from Adam Young. My challenge to you is go and listen to those again. Go and write them down. Go and keep those as your blueprint. Those factors that influence contact. The impact laws. And write them down in order. Ground contact, face contact, speed, face direction, swing path, angle of attack, dynamic loft. I wouldn't worry about dynamic loft as much unless you're really advanced. But if you can improve the ground contact, improve the face quality contact, speed, I would wait on some. Face direction, swing path, definitely. You adjust those and you will see a difference in the way your golf ball travels. That I will promise you. And sometimes, as you heard, or sometimes, most times, as you heard there from Adam, and I as an instructor have certainly experienced this, if you just go about fiddling around, experimenting, if you hit the ball in the heel, try and strike it in the toe. If you hit the ground early, try and strike the ground late. And you will find that you will organize yourself to make things happen. And en route to making that adjustment, the opposites, if you will, if you hit a high slice, try and hit a low hook, en route to that low hook, you will find where the sweet spot is. It's a simple way to basically self-discovery and figuring out what you have to do to strike the golf ball better. And in the final analysis, never forget that no matter what the quality of the information is, you have to be able to understand and apply, and then most importantly, appropriate to yourself. Remember, I might like your chili recipe a little less spicy. I don't follow your recipe to the T. I might adjust the amount of chili I put in there just to make it perfect for me. Remember that you're getting recipes from us and you're learning what is the sweet spot, what is the correct taste for you. Good luck as you try. Let us know how you go. Tweet us. We are at On The Mark Radio. Thanks for downloading. Share this with your friends and get out and play golf. Have lots of fun. Make lots of birdies. Take it easy. This broadcast and all associated rights, including copyright, are owned exclusively by the PGA Tour and may not be used in whole or in part without the prior written permission of the PGA Tour. So no-